Well, this visit by President Medvedev is actually his first official visit to the United States. He's been here before. It hasn't been an official uh, head of state summit in that sense. Um, and of course, they have had an official meeting uh, in Moscow uh, when President Obama went there last summer. Uh, so this is an important meeting in its own right, setting aside the modernization, technological, um, economic agenda, which President Medvedev has highlighted for this visit. That will probably be at the top of the general sort of atmospherics of the meetings. I think there'll be a lot of talk a lot of rhetoric about how the U.S. and Russia have made progress on security issues, but now it's time to make progress on economic and trade relations. Uh, I think the WTO will be very much on the table. That's something that uh, many people thought would be done already years ago. Certainly the Russians thought that. Um, there was a lot of talk on the American side that by the end of 2009 that would be done. Didn't happen. I think it's back on the front burner in terms of a priority for both sides. Uh, the 123 uh, Civilian Nuclear Cooperation Agreement is before the U.S. Congress right now. Uh, it will go into force unless the Congress passes a law to object by the August recess. Um, so that's also both an economic and a security issue. I think there'll be major security issues, though, still on the agenda for the two leaders, because remember, this is a summit. And at a summit, the presidents will talk about the big issues of the country. So certainly Kyrgyzstan, um, the explosive violence of recent weeks there. Um, it's not clear what the United States and Russia would do altogether, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, talking about potential uh, responses if things get worse, um, when and if things get better, uh, how they might deal with the provisional government and the results of the referendum there. Uh, I think obviously Afghanistan has been a priority for the U.S. and Russia for some time now. Uh, Russia has a sense the United States has come around to seeing things its way in terms of doing counter-narcotics, putting a priority on that along with counterinsurgency. The United States for uh, a year now has been enjoying the uh, lethal transit rights agreement that Russia signed uh, with the United States as a result of the last summit meeting uh, in Moscow. Uh, and so that reflects the Russian commitment to not seeing Afghanistan fall apart in its neighborhood of the world. Uh, and then, of course, you have nu nuclear security, where there's been a fair amount of progress, um, not entirely summed up by the START agreement, but that's a major part of it. Um, you had major Russian involvement in the nuclear security summit. Uh, Russia and the U.S. have obviously been leading the charge on Iran, um, somewhat surprisingly. So you have a number of security issues, all of which I think will be on the table, along with the economic issues. Improvement in the relationship depends on how you define success in the relationship. Um, Mike McFaul, who's the president's top advisor on Russia, has said that the reset was not just about friendly atmospherics between the United States and Russia, but it was about concrete outcomes. Certainly in terms of atmospherics, the relationship is more positive today than it was a year ago, than it was two years ago, and so it's been successful in that respect. But if you look at concrete outcomes, I think the record is a little bit more mixed. We should bear in mind it's been a short amount of time. Uh, the reset's only been going now for a year, a year and a half, depending on how you count. Um, so I think we have to give it some more time. But we have a lot of concrete results on areas where the United States and Russia very clearly had urgent shared interests dealing with national security. They signed the START deal. It's hopefully moving towards ratification. Um, they've cooperated on Afghanistan. They've continued to cooperate on counterterrorism, on counter-narcotics, all of the areas where the United States and Russia, frankly, uh, for 20 years have had a pretty solid record of increasing cooperation because it's simply in our interests. The areas where we have had less cooperation or less successful cooperation, civil society issues, democracy, NGO issues, economic engagement issues, all of these things I think have been subject to much the same forces that they have for a long time, which is that the United States and Russia are two very different societies, which are divided by things like our nature of government and law and rule of law, um, as well as the international economic situation where Russia is a major seller and exporter of natural resources and the United States is a major consumer, and it's hard to change those facts. New START ratification uh, has been, from the very beginning, a matter of moving in lockstep together on the U.S. and the Russian side. So the Russian have said that as soon as it's submitted to the United States Senate, it will be submitted to the Russian Duma, and as soon as it's ratified in the United States Senate, it will be ratified in the Russian Duma. Of course, at the same time, the Russians have said, we're going to have a real fight to ratify this in the Duma. Uh, it, I think that's a tough read. Uh, on the one hand, it's true. There is a real fight uh, in Russian society, but in some senses, it's a fight that goes all the way up to the Kremlin. Uh, and, and Vladimir Putin himself and Dmitry Medvedev himself may be of two minds uh, on, on doing uh, security cooperation with the United States. On the one hand, it certainly does serve Russia's interests. Uh, it gives them a lot of things that they wanted. 
Uh, on the other hand, it, it limits them, and that's what treaties do. And I think that those, those two are the, uh, the situations for the United States. And the U.S. Senate is slightly differently uh, positioned on this because, of course, that's a debate that exists in part uh, in isolation for the, from the administration. This is a debate that's being led by proponents of the treaty within the Senate. Dick Lugar and John Kerry are both strong supporters in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. But then you have strong opponents. Uh, Senator Kyle from Arizona has been a strong opponent uh, for years uh, to almost all nuclear security treaties, and certainly this one. Uh, so you have a number of senators who've come out strongly against the treaty, have either said they'll vote against it or they're leaning towards voting against it or have expressed reservations about it. Uh, but you also have a big block of senators who are voting for it. And the challenge is going to be, does this administration push for a vote simply because it thinks it has 67 or 68 votes, which is the minimum to get the supermajority, and just get the thing through and then call on the Russians to do the same thing? Or does it wait until it has an overwhelming majority, as we've seen in past arms control treaties, somewhere in the high? 70s or 80s or even 90s uh, would be following the past precedent. And I think that's going to take a lot longer, uh, and the Russian side uh, may get somewhat disillusioned if they have to wait around that long. Russia's response to the United States' uh, resolve to pass sanctions against Iran and then Iran's last-ditch uh, machinations to avoid those sanctions, I think has been driven by a couple of factors. Uh, first is the fact that Russia is very frustrated with Iran's behavior at this point. Uh, Russia has generally been opposed to punishing Iran. It doesn't believe that sanctions will work. It's said that, but at the same time, it's acknowledged at a certain point uh, Iran's own behavior may make sanctions inevitable. And I think we, we've reached that point, and that's why you saw Russia support the sanctions. The big turning point was probably when the Iranians lied to the world, but in particular lied to the Russians, who have generally been their partners on their peaceful nuclear program uh, when it came to the Qom facility. The Iranians had simply concealed that from the entire world, and the Russians didn't feel like they had any special level of trust. So what are they protecting in Tehran? Uh, I think was the Russian attitude. At the same time, I think that there are economic factors and there is the reset. There is the relationship between the U.S. and Russia. Uh, on the reset, I wouldn't call it a quid pro quo, but I would say that the generally positive spirit and momentum of the reset would have been interrupted uh, had the Russians put their foot down and said absolutely no to sanctions and vetoed them in the U.N. Security Council. And so I think weighing the benefits of the reset, when you look at the Russian uh, memo that was leaked a couple of weeks ago indicating that the Russian government actually does value the reset and it gets benefits out of it. Um, they were not willing to see that go poof uh, in exchange for protecting their pretty recalcitrant uh, friend and partner in Iran. That said, they still see Iran uh, as much more of a partner, as a country that they can deal with, as a country they have to deal with because it's right there on their doorstep in Central Asia. Um, it has the ability in some sense, there's a sort of Damocles hanging over Russia, which is that Iran could start supporting Islamic extremism within Russia and in the territories neighboring Russia much more than it does. Uh, so I think Russia feels a little bit threatened by Iran in that respect and doesn't want to provoke it overly much. Uh, the last factor, when you look at the fact that the Russians suspended uh, the sale of S-300 missiles um, and, and claim that that's in compliance with the UN Security Council resolution. These are the air defense missiles that would effectively prevent uh, an Israeli attack on Iran or perhaps provoke one because the Israelis might have to attack before the missiles were deployed if the sale went through. Um, the fact that Russia did that I think is an indication that it sees that it has much more to gain through playing with the international community on this and with the United States than the opposite. And, and the case in point on that is the Civilian Nuclear Cooperation Agreement, the 123 Agreement for Russia, which has a major civilian nuclear power industry, um, a uranium enrichment industry, a plutonium industry reprocessing. They can make a lot more money if that agreement goes through than they would on simply selling this one weapon system to Iran. The United States and Russia have no immediate plans to intervene in Kyrgyzstan. That was the operative question that arose on Monday uh, when Rosa Atambayeva, the interim leader of Kyrgyzstan, literally directly reached out to the Kremlin and asked for troops. Um, some have suggested that she also reached out to the United States. I have not heard that confirmed. Uh, but in any case, it was clear that at that point they wanted intervention. The fact that neither side intervened at that point, and in fact they, they both handled it in a relatively arm's length fashion, slow, deliberate, careful about their responses, offering humanitarian aid, but that's about it. Um, that indicates, I think, that they're more or less on the same page. Is it the right page to be on at this moment? It's hard to say. You know, if the violence uh, calms down 
uh, we don't see a spiraling out of control, spilling over the borders into Tajikistan or Uzbekistan, then it maybe will have proved the right thing to do. Uh, if the opposite happens, I think people may be regretting that they didn't intervene earlier. Uh, so I think the United States and Russia are generally on the same page there, but they're being very careful not to risk too much um, by sending any kind of forces in on the ground, uh, whether it has a multilateral mandate or not. There's a set of kind of concrete challenges that we face in the immediate future, you know, whether START is going to be ratified or not and by how many votes. I think that's going to send a significant message about what the, at least the, the near or midterm future of U.S.-Russia arms control and perhaps even security cooperation is. I think if the Russians see that they put this much effort into a bilateral security agreement with the United States and it fails, uh, I think we could be off to a very rocky start for future cooperation. And the U.S. and Russia, with 95 percent of the world's nuclear weapons, that's more or less where global nuclear security starts. Um, so that, I think, is a major challenge. I think the 1-2-3 agreement is probably going to go through because it requires proactive action by Congress to stop it. Congress would actually have to pass a law. Uh, that doesn't appear likely to happen, although there's a resolution floating around. Um, so I think that'll be a positive step. Still a challenge, though. Uh, I think WTO, WTO accession is a major challenge. Uh, the United States and Russia are going to have to come to terms on things like intellectual property rights protection, where Russia still hasn't budged uh, from the position it's held for some uh, decade or so, uh, which is basically that intellectual property protection doesn't apply in Russia. Um, it's going to have to come around to the realization that that's not consistent with creating a knowledge economy in Russia. If Russians are going to become innovators, then their intellectual property needs protection just like American and Western ideas do as well. I think the, the largest uh, obstacle potentially is what I would call a bump in the road for reset. And that is, if Russia perceives wrongly, I think, that the United States' willingness to engage to make Russia a priority and to dual track some of our disagreements so that we can move forward in the areas where we see eye to eye and we have common interests without getting hung up on the disagreements over, for example, Georgia, NATO expansion, missile defense, et cetera, democracy and human rights. Um, if Russia perceives that as having been some sort of unspoken quid pro quo, which I think is quite likely, uh, then there is a significant possibility that if something flares up in the future in any one of those areas and the United States responds as it is fully expected to do, the Congress will respond, the White House will respond, will be very harsh on Russia, then the Russians may view this as sort of throwing the whole deal down the well. Uh, that the deal's off and you might start to see Russian retribution in response uh, because certainly the Russians do not view these as dual track issues, that we're going to isolate our disagreements and work only on our areas of cooperation. I think for the Russian side this is all of a piece and I think that that's probably the biggest challenge down the road for reset.